Great to see you all again. Um, so I wanted to do something completely different today. Yesterday, I had I wanted to just sort of show you a way that I introduced the Constitution and the Federalist Papers to my students. But I'm hoping today that we can have a conversation together um, and pull uh, our different teaching methods, talk a little bit about different ways to approach the teaching of the Constitution, different reasons to do that. Um, I have more ways that I do that, that I could also share, uh, but I don't want to lecture at you again. <laughs> I did want to kind of share, I would want to sort of guinea pig myself and kind of show you uh, where the scholarship takes me and how I think about the constitution at the moment. Um, so I thought I would actually just start, we can kind of go around, not everybody has to give an answer to this question, but I would really love to hear from you all, how you introduce the constitution to your students um, what exercises you do with them uh, that that have that have worked well. Happy to hear some stories of failures too, since I think that's a great way to think about uh, how we all improve our own practice. So I have everybody in gallery view today, so I'm hoping I won't miss hands waved at me, but probably using the Zoom hand function is 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 going to be best. And I, I know there's plenty of people that didn't get a chance to raise a hand yesterday. So I'd love to have people who haven't, didn't have a chance to speak yesterday or ask a question yesterday pop up as well. Um, Rob, do you wanna start us off? Um, sure, I mean, a project I've been doing for past several years, um, some other teachers might be familiar with from the Zen Education Project, which is a constitutional convention role play where um, the students are given roles of people that would not, for the most part, have actually been at the Constitutional Convention. Um, and so sort of five different groups, uh, workers, farmers, uh, bankers, merchant class people, uh, the plantation owners, and enslaved African Americans, and informed a bit about what their you know, particular interests are, what's happening for them, what they really would want to see come out of this, uh, topics like payment in kind, um, topics of course like, what about slavery? What's gonna, uh, the constitution gonna say about that? And um, through several steps they, they work through and they negotiate and uh, formulate their own constitution. And then we use that to compare to the actual constitution uh, and figure out who won and analyze the perspective of the people who were actually at the constitutional convention. Uh, and then that leads us into a reading of Federalist number 10. And can you remind me what age, what grade students you're teaching? Um, and then can you tell us a little bit about whether you think this, uh, I mean, presumably you've done it a few times, you think it works well enough to keep doing it, but what works and what doesn't work? Um, so I teach 11th grade students, AP US history. Um, and uh, I mean, I think, it works in terms of having them have a, a critical approach to the constitution um, and to think about alternatives to it. Um, kind of following on this, usually we go into the Bill of Rights and we also think about um, what we may have included in there or what we may have excluded from the Bill of Rights as the next activity. Um, the, this year, um, and I don't know if this is part with remote, but there were a few students who felt uncomfortable with um, that we would be in an exercise where we would be considering that slavery could possibly be legal. And they were uncomfortable being put in a historical position of um, something that they felt was deeply immoral. Mm -hmm. Because you're assigning students to be slave owners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anyone else do a role-playing exercise? Not necessarily the same one. Um, Matt, you do something role player ish. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I guess it's like fairly role play. I, uh, basically having, um, students looking at, uh, James Madison. This is back when I, I don't teach 12th grade government anymore. I now teach sixth grade world history. So I would not do this with sixth grade world history, but with 12th grade government, um, we would look at the, um, James Madison's notes. And usually I'd hand over, you know, uh, you know, you know, five or six pages of excerpts that focus on, you know, different 
you know, big players at the convention. And so students are working in groups and uh, we're basically trying to re-come up or like recreate like the debates that would have been happening at the Constitutional Convention. So find, you know, the people who, you know, thought there should be, you know, three presidents and like one president from each, you know, part of the country uh, or, you know, stuff like that, that like, um, I think students generally think is like kind of cool. It's kind of like an alternate history kind of thing of like, imagine like, what would we be like today had the people who wanted there to be three presidents, uh, you know, mm-hmm. what would it, what it, what it look like today? So mm-hmm. um, yeah, so I don't know, it's kind of-, kind of Okay, like, so it yeah. sounds like as with Rob's exercise, you're really interested in helping the students to s- have a sense of contingency, that this isn't a foreordained political order. This is something that is constructed, was was constructed at a moment in time by a specific group of people, other groups of people would have built it differently. Um, And that something about that immersive experience in acquainting yourself with the actual delegates or thinking about a different set of possible delegates does a bit of a bit of a bit of that work. Felicia? You do something different? Yeah, um, I have done um, recreations or reenactments in the past, but the last few years, I've taught this for so long, but um, I've just given them, like they have their own pocket constitutions and then I'll give them a list of questions where they have to actually, I'll say like in real time and say, say, can Rachel run for Congress? Can, uh, you know, Toby and Sam marry? Can, you know, Ben bring in his AK-47 to school? Like where they, they just give, I give them sort of like, some of it's like silly and some of it's not, and just like different scenarios. So th- that's like our, my cold intro. Like here's the constitution, I'm just gonna throw it at you just to get them to read through the constitution and see how they can answer the questions. Some of them are just silly. They're t- it's 10th grade US history, but just to get them to, to familiarize themselves with the text of the constitution. So then that's usually the, it's, I felt like it's worked well in the past. Um, and just say, again, just you, this group, <laughs> you know, um, your ages and everything, how does it apply to get them to an understanding of how to interpret. Um, so that has worked sometimes it, it, it does. Um, anyways, it generally has worked at recreations in the past. I've, I've found some challenges similar to what I've just heard in ter- um, I don't know, some of it's like already a foregone conclusion, but also with that, then um, another constitution project, I'll give them various case laws, various sort of more well-known cases and have them use their, like assess the opinion and dissents based upon their reading of the constitutions. And then mm-hmm. they'll, you know, that's more the, the written component um, and analyze that. Cause I'm just trying to get them more conversant with, conversant with the, the language of the constitution. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really interestingly different approach in that, you know, we can think about in a historical, in, in, in the aim of historical methods and my, the way I tend to teach a constitution, I'm really getting, trying to get students to think about how it was written in the, and read in the 18th century. But I think it's really intriguing to have your entry point be, since, since it's both a historical document and a legal instrument, to have your point of entry be, it's a legal instrument. What is it, what is, what are the, what is it, what is it telling you about what's allowed and what's not allowed in the world that we now inhabit? It'd be a really different way. You, you do need to do both of those things when yeah, you work with students sure. of the constitution. Um, but where you start is a really, is a really, really interesting question. Ellen, what, what do you do to remind us who you're teaching? Okay, so I teach um, AP government and also AP US history. So um, I have two different things, one for the AP Gov, and it's kind of evolved from the fact that we have, when we have parent conferences, we have these shortened periods. So for my AP Gov classes, this is usually about maybe six or eight weeks into the semester, I buy um, six newspapers, that morning's New York Times, they all have copies of the pocket copy constitutions, and I put them in teams and they're going to earn extra credit. And their job is with a bunch of post-it notes to try to identify what from current events has what application to the constitution. They can't Mm -hmm. repeat clauses. They can't repeat. They can repeat like within the first amendment, something can be religion Mm -hmm. and something can be free press. I always give them the Mm -hmm. one free, you get one free press for the New York times that you're done with that. Move on um, to, as an example. And then they go wild looking for everything. There's commerce, there's everything. They're looking in every section of the paper, looking Mm -hmm. for where parts of the constitution apply. It's, it's very frenetic, but it's super fun, and they know they're going to mm-hmm. get extra credit for it. Um, for my US, uh, my AP US students, I do this at the end of the year. I ask students to take on the role of, a, of either a current person or like not current, a, a post, uh, post-constitutional era person, writing a letter asking, 
what the hell did you mean when you wrote this? Because now that I'm president or now that I'm, mm-hmm. you know, the person in charge of this thing, how mm-hmm. is this supposed to work? And I, I know you, you talked about originalism, but sometimes it's the other way also I've done where, you know, mm-hmm. how is Jefferson going to give Lincoln any advice on slavery? Which is really interesting because then it's like how complex so it kind of is a nice review and it also talks thematically about some of the overarching mm-hmm. issues that continue. And so those are two different and the kind of tail ends of the year for different classes, but two different ways to look at the constitution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. I also love the way that maps on to the two different problems, the two different approaches that kind of, you know, one, one is a political science approach, current affairs, and, and one, is a, one is more of a historical methods approach um, and a kind of constitutional history approach. I love that newspaper exercise. That sounds super fun. Um, one thing I point out as I do the sort of course of American history, because students generally don't know this, that the deliberations at the Constitutional Convention, which we often have them read, I mean, Matt's exercise involves looking at what people were proposing then, that those were secret for 50 years. Like everybody took a vow of secrecy for 50 years and most of them were dead by, by 1837, which is the 50th anniversary. But the reason they did that was because they didn't want anybody to say, what did you mean? It, like you weren't allowed to answer that question. And so, you know, with the Missouri Compromise and you get to 1819, people are like, well, what did they want us to do here? The frank, people who are delegates were not supposed to answer that question. People kept writing to Madison. What did you mean? What should we do about Missouri? Um, and that when, when, the, when the anniversary finally happens in, 17, in 1837 and Dolly Madison gets Madison's notes published. Then suddenly the abolitionist movement goes crazy because the abolitionists are like, damn, man, we can win this argument. Look at all the compromises that they made here. Like that the fact that the what lies behind the Constitution was considered so politically explosive that people and that people kept a secret for 50 years also kind of astonishes uh, students. It's an interesting way to think to think about it. Um, Jeremy, what do you do with the Constitution? Uh, well, I have I have the joy of teaching nine year olds, little fourth graders, who are um, the, who who love who love an argument. That's their number one thing. And so the way we start, given that it's all very very remote for them, um, you know, for them the 18th century, like that's like 19 2010 is very distant for them. So it's a long time ago. So and um, we begin with a classroom constitution, and we write that try to establish the idea that we're making a framework for making decisions. And then we're also trying to come up with, um, with rights for the pupils. And once they've got that framework, and, and they argue tremendously about that, and, and, the, and the idea is that they get the idea that this is born of argument, that this process is argumentative and contentious, and that if we did it in a month, we'd do it differently. And if we'd done it last month, we'd have done it differently. And if we do it next year, we'd do it differently. So they've got an idea of contingency. And then it sets them up to actually read the constitution. Um, and, um, you know, we, we really simplify it for them, but at the end of it, it's nice to get them to think what rights would they add to the Bill of Rights? You know, I try to goad them into thinking that children should be allowed to vote, um, given that they're the ones with the longest time horizons, you know, I, like they're very concerned about the environment. So I, you know, try and tell them, you know, like, what did the environment ever do for me? You know, I'm going to be gone by the time it's ruined, but you guys are going to live with it. So, um, um, so, try to, so try to get them to think of the constitution as potentially flexible and something that they could have a contribution to. Do you ever go back later in the school year and revisit the constitution that you ratified earlier on? Um, that's a good, I mean, yeah, that is one of the issues. One of the other issues, of course, is that you're right. Um, we tend to do it near the end of the year, but then I'm going to loop with them. So maybe yeah. I'll do it next year. The other problem, of course, is the classroom, as far as they're concerned, is a benign despotism. So um, it's really hard yeah. for them. Yeah. The challenge for us is the hurdle for them to imagine themselves as somehow empowered in the classroom. Yeah. Well, it would be fun, even if you didn't loop with them for your next set of nine-year-olds to say, two years ago, uh, my students made this constitution. We have to live by this now. Is that going to be all right? Because, yeah. you know, just to point out, we're stuck with this one. So, and then they might say, no, we want to write our own. Like, yeah. I think it would, or if it's, or if you do the loop to say, do we still, is this still okay? You know, the question of whether the constitution is, a, is alive, is an organic thing, or, you know, is etched in stone, is a, is a, 
I think because exactly those questions of durability and permanence and they're in such an evanescent, they reinvent themselves every day. So how could, you know, how could something last is a really interesting, interesting question. Um, Great idea. Yeah, that's fun. That's fun. Uh, Harry. Um, so I mean, we actually, I teach 11th grade at, at Beacon uh, School in, in Manhattan. And, you know, we have the luxury, it's not an AP class, and we also don't have to do the regents because we're part of this consortium of schools that do performance-based assessment. So everything that we do, it, I, I have essentially complete freedom, um, which I know a lot of my colleagues don't, uh, and it's a public school. So that's, that's I would start there. Um, and so we, you know, the, in, I, it's interesting to hear other teachers because I also do put it in the context, both a historical context, but also a governmental and legal context. Um, and so we I do some exercises with them, like I have them draft their own plan of government, uh, even before we read uh, the various plans of government. I have, we do a whole exercise of, you know, what rights would, what do you think the rights we should have? And put them in groups and they, they and you know, it very, quickly they latch on to the what they know in their heads because they're pretty sophisticated in the in the bill of rights but then they also of course talk about rights of education rights to health care rights to clean water so you sort of see what's not in <laughs> our notion of rights and the a discussion about negative versus positive rights comes out of that which is very interesting in terms of the the historical i mean we look at uh, the, the, some of the documents about the, what was wrong with the Articles of Confederation. And then we, I really try to give them as much as possible, the debates uh, that occurred. So like one, in, the most interesting class every year is always the three-fifths compromise. And the question that I pose to them is, if you were an abolitionist for the North, how would you vote? Um, and they really sort of struggle morally and politically because they know the right thing to do is to have them count, but if I'm doing that, I'm giving them power to the South. And, and so they sort of see how the constitution itself is this essentially political document and political compromise of the time. Um, the, the sort of the end, and then I also give them some secondary, like we read bits of Robert Dahl's, um, how democratic is the constitution, um, which really is very provocative for them and a little bit of you know, beard, uh, here is uh, how much George Washington made. And, and the last question of sort of the unit uh, is, is the constitution more about protecting liberty or protecting property? And that's kind of their essay question. Um, mm -hmm. And they can draw on whatever they, they want. Um, and we really use the constant, and then the rest of the year is essentially, uh, the rest of American history is about sort of I view it as three different big units, which is the, uh, the relationship between government and the economy and how we have the powers of the government trying to address our social and economic problems. Then it's all about equal protection. So there's th that sort of strand. And then finally it's war and dissent, it's foreign policy and looking at, you know, all, so that's, and I go back and forth in time. Uh, mm -hmm. But really, and you know, we do Jamestown and slavery and the revolution stuff about the revolution before the Constitution, mm -hmm. and also as much as possible, you know, when something happens in the news, it immediately becomes uh, fodder for either the constitutional discussion or something else that happened in history. So we're mm -hmm. very conscious mm -hmm. of current events, and and yeah. and that's helpful for them. I mean, I would report to you guys because I'm not sure that this is always obvious, but. Um, our incoming students are desperate to learn more about the constitution. Um, I think that it, it fell out of a lot of curricula for a while um, as a real centerpiece of how to understand the course of American history or the nature of American uh, political science. Uh, weirdly, I mean, certainly in higher education it did, um, but if you teach a course, a college level course on the constitution now, students just turn up in droves, which wouldn't have been the case even say five years ago. I mean, I think mm -hmm. the sense that we're living through a constitutional crisis, especially with mm -hmm. regard to immigration um, and racial justice questions just has really driven student interest. So I can imagine you get kind of, it seems like a dry subject sometimes, but what I really appreciate about what everyone has talked about you teaching is how much you use the occasion of 
investigating the Constitution as an opportunity to think about how the classroom functions as a political community. Um, it obviously is, you know, you are the king and it's you are divinely, you have a divine right to rule, but that there's a, but that the nature of um, constitution making is deliberation. And that is how we also believe education happens is through deliberation. You can, you know, there's a lot, you can ask them to read, you can, you can lecture at them, but at the end of the day, the purpose of thinking about the constitution and restoring its contingency or connecting it to current events is to help students engage those, those civic skills of deliberation. Uh, which are, which are foundational. That's actually though also why I have to. I will just confess I'm not a role advocate of role playing. I because I feel and I, I nor do I think it's really possible for us to put ourselves in the position of someone living in 1787. Um, if asked what a northern anti-slavery delegate would do, walk away, leave that convention. It's completely indefensible. Like I, I just like call. The South Carolina's bluff, like I, I <laughs> well, just, a lot of some of them say that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but we just, but I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure where that go, myself. I'm not yeah. sure kind of where that goes. Like, but I could not, in good conscience, ask a student to inhabit the views of a slave owner. Um, so I, like, I get that that's a Zen thing. Um, uh, but I, but I also, I, 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 I think it's a fairly explosive um, and volatile thing. To consider doing, and that there are, you know, there's such a rich panoply of of ways to do this kind of, to do this kind of investigation. Um, I I I do want to uh, ask some more questions about this rights issue and the question the question of rights. But I'm trying to. Oh, Tara, you had your hand up though before. I wanted to know what, what, how you teach the Constitution. Yeah, I, I take a little bit of a different um, approach, I think, than, than some of the people who have been speaking so far. And um, what we do is we give the kids um, excerpts from the Constitution. And then on each day for about a week, we have one question that they're using the Constitution to support their, their argument on. So we start with just a journal, which is like, what do you believe the purpose of government is? And that just sort of like gets them thinking about it. But then we move through a series of questions, um, which are, to what extent does the Constitution align with the ideals of the revolution? To what extent does the Constitution set up all Americans for ability to exercise rights to liberty and the pursuit of happiness? And um, to what extent does the Constitution Constitution effectively address the vulnerabilities presented in the Articles of Confederation. So they go through each of those on a day-to-day -day basis. And at the end, we sort of have a clap discussion about it. But then we come back around and like the wrap-up question of the week is now that we've sort of like explored this from all these angles, to what extent do you, do you believe that the Constitution upholds your proposed purpose of government? So they sort of like start thinking about what they think the meaning of government is, walk through this. Do they the share that or the original posting of what they think government is, is that yeah. collectively? Show? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of neat that they like can start to think about government in their own perspective and then start to think about what other perspectives are and then wrap up the week with that. And then we actually move from there into the historiography of the constitution. So we take a pretty big, pretty big jump, but um, it, you know, it doesn't sound like super exciting and bells and whistles engaging, but they really get into these conversations. Um, mm -hmm. And I teach 11th grade IB history of the Americas. Okay, yeah, because not everybody's getting into the history there. Does anyone work with um, contemporary Supreme Court cases? Like, like go to the OIA project and have them listen to oral arguments or, uh, yeah, okay, Abby, yeah, what do you, tell me what you do. Um, wait, but I'm sorry, Rebecca, did you have your hand up earlier? Yes, yeah, um, I did. Rebecca did. She did. She was ahead okay. of me. I'm sorry, Rebecca, why don't you go first and then Abby? <laughs> yeah, please. That's okay. Um, to answer the first question, um, one thing that I teach 12th graders, so it's my classroom is able to be a little bit more of democracy. Um, and the way that we frame that is through checks and balances. And so thinking about like, what are the ways that students and teachers can check each other? Um, and acknowledge that one might actually have more power than the other, the same way that branches might not all equally have the same amount of power. Um, and then also Facing History has a tool called Universe of Obligation, which is asking students to think about like in concentric circles, 
who is valued most by a document or a government or a society. And so that's been an interesting lens to use to look at the Constitution. Um, and then in terms of contemporary court cases, um, the, the I would say most fulfilling unit that we've done is around search and seizure. And we did, we looked at three different cases about student searches in school. Mm -hmm. um, and I work at a school that has scanning um, and metal detector. So it was like really relevant and it was able to lead towards pretty traditional mock trial type thing. Um, but it was really cool for the students to get to, I think having a topic that was so accessible to them made the language more accessible because they have the context that it's talking Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, and there are so many of those schoolhouse cases. Yeah. Abby. Um, so um, the course that I teach is an interdisciplinary course taught with an English teacher. It's called Constructing America, and it's a survey course. And so when we get to the Constitution early in the year, the kids have already read um, Edmund Morgan and American Paradox, and I definitely they read it from cover to cover the constitution and we talk about the structure, what's the mindset and it, how it really is a tool of white privilege and white power. And then we build on it in terms of um, Supreme Court cases about housing, about gender equity. And I have them going to the Oyez website a lot to listen to either snippets, but I also do a lot with podcasts. So I'm using Bloomberg Law, um, mm -hmm. using strict scrutiny, which I love. Um, and, you know, pieces of, oh, then there was another project that gave us the, went through each of the amendments, which I can't remember right now. Oh, yeah. Did um, it have a more perfect one? Exactly. Yeah. More perfect. Right. So that was really useful. I um, love that. I, I am having my seniors listen this weekend for an Indigenous history course to the most recent case um, argued last week about whether a... Um, Indigenous officer had the right to pull over. I'm not citing the whole case correctly, but that will be the first time that they're going to listen to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be easier for seniors who in the spring are feeling a little bit more mm -hmm. relieved than my juniors who are about to sit for the ACT. Um, mm -hmm. But I think using pieces of Oyez and, and letting them either read the transcript or the pieces of the mm -hmm. argument is really valuable. Have you ever had, watched the documentary film with them, Tribal Justice? No. Mm -mm. Oh, it's fantastic. Okay, it's great. These, it's about these three judges um, who have jurisdiction over Native nations, they each in, a different nation, um, and they they work with Indigenous law. And um, it's it's beautifully, it's a beautiful, beautifully, beautifully done, magnificent storytelling. It's very, um, it's very moving. It's very distressing. Um, yeah. But it's a it's a really interesting way to think about alternative constitutions and alternative modes of governance and a different notion of what consent of the governed is. Yeah. Um, like that these can be legally binding within the United mm -hmm. States because of the sovereignty of these judiciaries is really important and interesting. Um, but doesn't really for your constitution, but for your for the for um, other class, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. There was something else I was gonna say, but but I have forgotten. Um, I have Peter and then Emily. Yeah, I did some work with street law back, I think it's a DC based uh, Supreme Court, uh, kind of a professional development education support group. And with that, uh, I've, I've always, when I teach a Supreme Court elective, I uh, I use the bong hits for Jesus case, the free speech case, which I mean, the kids just love that. So it just resonates with them. And, uh, and then of course, uh, yeah, I, I used Oyez for the for the oral arguments after. I mean, I have them, you know, there's kind of three groups, right? The lawyers for the school, lawyers for the student, and then the Supreme Court judges. So they kind of role play. And then after they do it, we get to hear the, you know, the real lawyers. Uh, and it kind of is amazing how, you know, the arguments actually are mimicked, you know, because, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a certain logic that even the kids can figure out to, uh, to that. So it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another education case um, I don't know if anyone's ever taught is Plyler versus Doe. Uh, 1982 was an immigrant. Um, there was a Texas law um, that uh, undocumented immigrants, the, the state had no obligation to educate undocumented immigrants. And it was challenged on a, on a kind of right to education ground. Um, it went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, children who had been denied an education, um, kids who had um, come with their families from Mexico 
and then their younger siblings could go to school, but the, their older siblings couldn't. So there are all these just heartbreaking stories of, you know, a six year old trying to teach a seven year old how to write because one of them is a citizen, one is not. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a really interesting um, kind of schoolhouse Supreme Court case. Emily. All right, what is it called again? Sorry. Plyler versus Doe. Um, I, I have a New Yorker article about it. If you look up my name in the case, P L Y L E R versus Doe. Um, there's actually great material available. The judge in the case whose name was Judge Justice, um, who ruled on behalf of the uh, immigrant families. Um, he has written about it. And then a reporter for the um, LA Times went back years later and tracked down most of the kids who were involved. And almost all of them had become public school teachers. Um, it's kind of like a really interesting, like the, their family's fight for their right to get an education was the pivotal thing of their childhood. Um, I don't know, it's just a, it's a, it's, it's, it's not as taught as the uh, bong hits for Jesus. <laughs> and that's a different kind of appeal, um, but it, it's a really interesting immigrant rights case. Um, Emily. Hi, um, so I will say this, I said this in my small group yesterday, I'll say this again. This is my first year teaching con law, um, but this so far doesn't seem to have been a disaster. So for my class, we started off doing the historiography around the constitution, looking at the debates and all of those things and getting centered on what was actually happening in the 1780s. How were people living their lives and approaching things? But then my next unit right after we looked at the Supreme Court um, and how we moved our way through the Supreme Court was um, for different assignments. I assigned them um, Supreme Court justices, sorry, um, Supreme Court justices, they start off with like a bio project. And then as we learn, work our way through the amendments, um, they do some reflection exercises on how that justice would have approached it. And then after that, my class is thematic. Um, but what's helpful there is as we're going through cases, like this past week, we were looking at Native American rights and the constitution, um, is that they're able to come back into the conversation as they're um, reading opinions and writing their own case studies. And even though their case studies are supposed to be objective, fact-based case studies, they often come in and say, uh, they have to make some comment about like, well, Breyer would have said that, like must have said this. Um, and we're also um, in October when the term schedule came out, they each got to pick a case that they were interested in. And so they've been following it um, through um, through the schedule and listening to podcasts and reading blog posts about those cases. And then they're getting ready to do, um, reflection essays on how their justice that they focused on in the fall responded to the case, um, and some case law history around mm -hmm. that, um, that, that informs that decision. So for me, it's all about mm -hmm. like, I want them to hear as many contemporary cases as possible. I want them to be exposed to as many cases as possible. Street law is amazing. Um, so that way they actually can see how stuff gets mm -hmm. applied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great. Um, also, like the objectives too of a constitutional law class are going to be a little bit different than the A push curriculum. Um, but I think that cases just are so fun to teach. Like there's, there are people, there are real stakes, there's a plot, like, you know, like, and then people have strong views and they argue about it. Like it's very dramatic. It has a kind of CSI feel to it. I think it's a natural for, for all sorts of reasons. What I try to do when I do historical cases though, is explode the actors. And this is consistent with the sort of the Zen exercise, right? So when I do, um, I teach my US history course as deliberations and we do a big deliberation for 1787, which is did the constitution need a bill of rights? And I assign half the students have to argue yes and have to argue, yes. I don't give them a choice because I want them to practice making an argument from evidence and not just bullshitting. So, which they tend to be really good at. Um, but when we get to the civil war, we do, um, uh, did the constitution sanction slavery? And they read Lincoln and Douglas, but they also read Frederick Douglass. And they, they read an, a, a number of other interlocutors. Because um, if you're doing a contemporary case, there are, they, they know that there are a lot of interlocutors. And there are a lot of different kinds of people involved in the decision-making, the, 
the Supreme Court itself looks really different. Um, but I just, a correction that I try to make as a historian, which you saw a little bit in the lecture yesterday, right? Like if we're going to debate, if we're going to go back and look at Dred Scott, I refuse to just have them read Tawny, you know, like that's not okay, right? <laughs> like it's just not okay. We have to, you know, we have to read a bit about Dred Scott and Harriet Scott, and we have to read some Frederick Douglass, and we have to think about what's going, what, why the Indians not taxed things going on in there, like just to, 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 um, to, to expand the number of, of um, political thinkers and political speakers in any given moment to encompass what, you know, what we can actually now have given the, given the revolution in, in historical scholarship. So I would just suggest that. Um, I, I, I have more, more questions and more things I wanna talk about. But one thing I also just kind of wanted to say with regard to how I think about some of these matters is, um, and, and maybe this goes across the different types of courses. I don't think I'm encompassing the fourth graders, but the, the US history classes, the, um, what is it? The, the, um, uh, the con law, the, um, the sort of story of America classes, the comparative politics classes or US Gov classes is that um, I try to help students see that the, there's not just the one constitution, that the constitution has been rewritten twice. So we look at the 1787 constitution or the 1791 with the first 10 amendments. Then we look at the reconstruction constitution and kind of compare what's different. Like what did the, what did, before it failed, what did reconstruction set about doing? What did it rewrite? Um, and then we look at the progressive era New Deal Constitution, which you know, constitutional historians would say that's that's a wholly new reinvention of the system of government. Um, and then when you look at in those three moments, the 1791 Constitution, the 1870 Constitution, and the kind of 1937 Constitution, then the question that, and I guess like if I was in 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 do, undertaking fallacious a fallacious uh, move. We'd start with what does it need to look like now? But I think the the empowering thing for the students that all of you who are working with contemporary cases or listening to podcasts or, you know, having students report on a justice and look at a justice's opinion and see if it's what you thought it would be. These are all about like, what should we be doing now? What should you as a young person think about your relationship to this document, to the possibility of amendments? Do we need another constitutional convention? Should we make, should we reform the Supreme Court? All the kinds of questions that they see bandied about or, you know, hear about or, um, uh, or, or they, um, they put those in Ellen's class, they put the sticky, no <laughs> sticky notes in the newspaper because there's a question about court packing. Um, that, the now moment is, is a really difficult one for me as a historian to work with. I'd love to hear more about what people do with the, with the, with the Constitution now in the classroom. Is it something that you build towards? Is it something that you start with and move back from? Have you had difficult conversations in the Constitution now moment? Um, taken, a, taken an approach that you've maybe backed away from and reinvented? Are there lessons that you've learned that you want to share? I think I saw Rob first uh, and then Harry. Well, I was, I was going to ask a question about uh, how much or if at all you focus on the Articles of Confederation. Um, I don't spend much. I do all of American history in one semester. I have 13 weeks. Uh, we don't, and I'm not like preparing them for like an AP <laughs> US history test. So I can afford to gloss over those. Um, I, but, I, but, but you guys have uh, test-based reasons to really look at the Articles of Confederation, right? So um, I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm no particular help there. Um, I, mean, I was also just thinking in terms of talking about, you were saying the different types of constitution, you called it, you know, the, um, you referred to the Bill of Rights as a new constitution in essence, as it alters parts of that. And the three um, Civil War amendments is a new constitution. Uh, I'm wondering about, you know, framing that all the way back to um, the original, constitu original mm -hmm. constitution. Mm -hmm. Yep, you could absolutely do that. Uh, Harry. Um, sort of, uh, is kind of addresses your current question, but also goes back to when you're talking about Plyler. 
Um, so the, I mean, I sometimes, and I've taught a class where I have seniors and it's an elective where I basically say, we are going to take cases off the current Supreme Court docket using SCOTUS blog, which is, you know, the magical website, uh, which has basically everything that they can. And we sort of took ca current cases on a variety of issues. So you sort of see the entirety and the scope of constitutional, you know, you have Fourth Amendment stuff, property rights cases, governmental powers. And, you know, they're, they're, the kids can actually, with help, sort of read excerpts of cases and briefs and the well written briefs and things like that. So, in terms of contemporary issues, and I've done that with the regular American history class too, a little bit. Uh, and then we'll do, I mean, in that class, they were all supposed to be judges. So, mm -hmm. they act, I broke them up into courts and they were each responsible for one case as a bench memo to present to the court. And then they would deliberate and vote. And occasionally I'd bring some guest lawyers in to, to argue things mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, I mean, that when I can do that, it's magic because they really kind of absorb the lessons of the constitution in the contemporary context. There, you know, there's this, also there are sort of cases below the Supreme Court that present a lot of interesting issues like there's the the Cook versus Raimondo case in Rhode Island, which was just decided by the First Circuit, um, which is really an attempt to relitigate San Antonio versus Rodriguez and Plyler. And, you know, and you talk about, you know, there you have current stories mm -hmm. about kids who are being denied, you know, basic, uh, and a lot of in Rhode Island, a lot of uh, immigrant kids who are not in native English speakers and they're not getting, and the whole theory there is about civics education and that there's a constitutional right to civics education. That's, I think it was an interesting way, talking about that case with kids and doing that case is another sort of interesting entree. And, but I think just plucking cases off the docket really and doing them with kids is, is the best thing to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that seems really fun. And they're really, there's a whole bunch of lower court cases, right to education cases that are working yeah. their way up. Yep. So there will be a Supreme Court, you know, hearing of that, of some of those issues. I, I, I have, I have Ellen, Matt and Felicia, but I'm going to go to Julia because I haven't, you haven't asked a question yet, or I haven't heard from you yet. So I want to give you a chance to. Thanks. Jump. Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't have a question per se, but just something that's come up, I think, in the last four years of teaching the Constitution under the Trump presidency. I have students kind of coming in with a very uh, jaded and disillusioned perspective about the Constitution and its legitimacy in general. Like, they start out being like, yeah, we can learn about this, but it's not really a real thing anymore. Like, they kind of think the Constitution's dead. And so it's an interesting conversation to have with them to kind of, I don't want to be like, it's not dead. You know, I don't want to be that person who is rah-rah constitution because I see where they're coming from. But to be like, no, they're like, it is the backbone of our nation has so much legitimacy and importance and let's explore that together. But also, yeah, let's be real about the reasons why you're cynical and let's make space for that. So I, you know, I, I didn't see that when I originally started teaching the constitution. Mm -hmm that was not something that students were bringing up right off the bat. Um, but in these last couple of years, when we start with the constitution, the cynicism is like right at the forefront. And so that's kind of played into how we talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, I, in my US history survey class, I always let the students, um, we have a big um, nominating and a process and then a ballot for the students to decide what our final deliberation topic will be. And this year, it was almost universal. They wanted to deliberate whether we needed to have a new constitutional convention. Like they just fundamentally don't believe in the legitimacy of the constitution. It really, um, it, it really shook me. So I would love to hear how people, uh, uh, you know, if people have had Julie's experience or, or uh, how you've broken through that. Ellen, you've been waiting for a while now, so. Hi, so um, I just wanna say that this might actually help. Um, and this is gonna sound really silly, but, um, maybe it's my background because this is how I was trained. So um, pretty early on in the year, it's not usually the first lesson, but it's amongst the first. I actually have a really silly lesson where I asked the students to define the word sandwich. 
And it turns out there's actually a great, I used to do the hat rule because New York City has a rule about not wearing hats, but it's obviously it's not an issue. So my other school is a bigger issue. So it turns out there's a really cute video of, of, um, of Stephen Colbert actually interviewing uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. At the end of the interview, he actually asked her what's a sandwich. But the thing is that what's a sandwich, of course, everyone says they know what a sandwich is, but then I start showing pictures like is a hot dog a sandwich? Is a, tor you know, is a burrito a sandwich? And the reason that I start out by saying this is I say, you know, the language is so important. And part of it is that I want their writing to be precise because it drives me crazy when they're vague. But also I want them to understand how it's possible that for every interpretation, there's another interpretation. And so I actually, and, and every once in a while, it'll come up like in class and I'll say, yeah, that's like a sandwich, right? And they just all know what I mean because they know that whatever's being interpreted one way could be interpreted another way at another time. And so it's actually a really useful exercise in getting them to think in the idea that the frame, the constitution is a framework and we've been filling in the blanks according to whatever, you know, whims or currents or whatever, all these years, but it doesn't tell you what a sandwich is unless you add a lot more to the definition. And so I don't know if that is helpful to anybody, but it is a way that I start out with the approach, which is really language, understanding that every single word is gonna be possible to be parsed and interpreted and reinterpreted and misinterpreted, et cetera, et cetera. Great, great. There are these uh, famous literary debates between like famous writers of whether a hot dog is a sandwich. Do you ever watch these? They're, they're pretty funny. Lynn, I, we haven't have heard from you yet. How, what are you having success with and what are you struggling with? And have you confronted this question of cynicism or? Um, yeah, yeah, I was, I, I mean, that's why I raised my hand because I'm like, oh, I'm right in there. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I just sent, I teach participation in government 12th grade and then I'm a global teacher. So the, all the, when they get there to 12th grade, they've already all had me for global, kind of a smallish school. So, um, I, you know, when I, I, it's just centered on civics. So it's like, okay, yeah, we know we have all these problems. We know our country isn't working. So kind of what are all the tools in our toolbox? So amending the constitution would be one of them. Well, let's go down that path. What would that look like? Gain some appreciation for that. Well, we could rewrite the entire thing, right? So then kind of in that, when we're digging into that, I use, um, Freedom House and the Map of Freedom, and which they're kind of familiar with from 10th grade, and they know that the French Revolution during the 10 years they wrote how many different drafts, and right. So then I'm like, okay, well, pick an authoritarian country. Look at their constitution now. You know, pick maybe South Africa. They look there's some great things there in their constitution. Pick another democratic country. You know, pick your favorite. Like you want to be like Sweden. Well, pick their constitution. Take a look at it. You know, and then kind of just help them to see like, well, that's something we could do. We could rewrite it, you know <laughs> I mean? But, but it's difficult, right? Like that's a really different, when you really sit down and say, okay, how would we do this? Then they start to see, okay, well, that's why using, you know, politics, using activism, using all these other means are, are, are how we have adapted things, right? Like it's not so easy to sit down and think about changing the entire constitution. Um, so. That's how I kind of get at it. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I mean, I guess as you speak, it occurs to me another thing, maybe this is too intricate of a, of a project, but in teams, I suppose you could do something like this. You could look at something like the Comparative Constitutions Project and look up, say, equal rights for women or gender, gender equality in constitutions around the world. And then look up, because something like Freedom House that actually measures whether gender equality gives it a rating in those countries to see whether there's any relationship between a clause being in a constitution and the thing actually being delivered as a matter of policy. Because I bet there's really not as much of a connection as you would like to see there, right? And and then you'd have to like, so what's the, solve that problem for X? Like what's, what? why does that constitution not have enough legitimacy to deliver the right that it's guaranteeing? What is going on in the structure of civic authority in the nature of democratic institutions that it's interfering with? The constitution says this, but it's meaningless. In a way, maybe, Julia, like maybe that's a kind of end run around your question. Like, cause we know that there's stuff in our constitution that we're not honoring. And it's hard for us to see what's interfering with our ability to honor it. Is it, is it hyperpolarization? Is it dysfunction in Congress? Is it the calcification of the amendment process? 
Um, but maybe maybe there's something comparative as a way, there'd be a way to see that with a little more acuity, um, just because there's such tremendous resources out there. Um, and it is really great for, I would just say like as a college instructor, when students come with some of the ability to locate those resources and know what you can do with them, uh, it's, it's very exciting for them to then be able to apply them. Um, and I was just going to say, I was just going to add, like, because the U.S. Constitution was the model for so many, but then others have gone further and, you know, yeah. so like maybe it's time to revise ours, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I said I want to talk a little bit about rights, but I, best, I bet we won't have time to, but I did want to recommend to you all a really uh, incredible book called How Rights Went Wrong that's just out by um, Jamal Green. He's a law professor at Columbia. Um, I wrote the foreword for this book, like I really, really love it, but I can imagine even like asking your students to read the introduction. It's very, it just, it kind of, um, it's a very brief uh, summary of Green's argument, which is um, we have too many rights and all of our political debates are absolutist because I, either I win and I have all the rights and you have none, or you win and you have all the rights and I have none that we have a kind of zero sum rights um, jurisprudence and that other countries don't have this. And he, the book is about explaining how that happened, how rights went wrong is the argument, historical argument of the book, um, but that there aren't forms of adjudication and negotiation and arbitration that are written into how we understand rights. Um, and the, you know, you will, I discern that the reason is um, so many Americans were disenfranchised for so long that, that seeking political change through legislation and running for office was denied them. So they sought rights-based solutions through the judiciary, which, is, which kind of has screwed up our political process. Um, and Green, Jamal Green's argument is we can't get anything really right, including race and racial justice until we fix how rights went wrong. It's a very provocative argument. It's really new and fresh. Um, I had him come visit my class and uh, the students were like fascinated, but also very, they disagreed with him. Like they argued with him and it was really great. Um, but just in terms of mixing things up with something like kind of brand new, uh, it's, it's how rights went wrong. Okay, so um, Matt, you have been waiting as well. Yeah, uh, I was kind of uh, thinking about the, the question about how do you, you know, address kind of these contemporary issues and, and kind of get past some of the cynicism um, and, and this is kind of from when I was teaching uh, 12th grade, but I think for me, one of the most important things was getting students outside of the classroom and seeing kind of what these things actually look like uh, when they're happening. Um, I, I think one of the things that, that I used to do, and I was teaching in Durham, North Carolina, and so we we're about 30 minutes from the Capitol in Raleigh, and, um, and so we would go to the state Supreme Court there and sit in on oral arguments um, at the uh, state Supreme Court, and what's really cool is that um, I'm usually like, like, uh, uh, you know, they're so kind of dumbfounded that like anyone's coming to see their arguments because like when, when we went, the room was completely empty. And so it was just like, you know, 40, 18 year olds. And then like these two lawyers, uh, like one of them was like a public defender. And, you know, I, I think they were just completely thrown off their guard of having like a packed audience. Uh, but then what's also really cool is that afterwards the, uh, justices came down and talked with us. Um, and, and I think part of it is like, I think with a lot of like the lower courts, you know, with, with uh, state Supreme Courts, you know, appeals courts, you know, federal district courts, circuit courts, and all of them, we've, I've had a ton of luck in terms of them being very responsive and excited about talking with students, um, which is really cool. Uh, taking students to, I, I, I think one of the other really cool things that we do is uh, I took students to the uh, local jail um, and we talked with people who were detainees there um, and kind of getting into questions about the Sixth Amendment and that, you know, we had, we talked with one person who had been pre-trial for five years um, because their public defender, you know, was so backlogged and, you know, they hadn't talked to their public defender in six months and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I think that was really interesting. And then uh, kind of on the, the further end is uh, taking, you know, if, depending on the resources, taking students to DC and actually seeing oral arguments at the Supreme Court, um, mm -hmm. which again, I think, most students, I, I, I think for one, like a lot of students, their minds are blown that you can just wait in line and then go see oral arguments. Um, 
and uh, we, we got one time got to talk with the Supreme Court justice just by like writing to them, and, like spamming all of the Supreme Court justices and one uh, wrote back and met with us. Um, but I, I think getting to sit in an oral argument at the US Supreme Court and just looking around and, and seeing everything going on is I think is for a lot of students uh, is really, really cool. Yeah, no, and we'll stay with them forever as a, as a, as when they think about how the government works, they'll have something to imagine and picture in their head from their own experience. Um, uh, Felicia. That's super cool, by the way. Um, I'm gonna try not to take up too much space. First of all, I love your framing of the three moments because it's interesting because I feel like I've sort of organically, I start off with like a current reading and then I say as a historical document, it shapes. So over time, like for it, like as just an example that's coming to my head, like when we study the Chinese Exclusion Act, we always look at the case US versus Kim Wong Ark and like how, what does this do to reflect this historical moment? And last week we read Shelby County versus Gardner. Um, so I need to, you know, after the Georgia state, um, basically voter suppression laws, like every time um, something like massive historical movements. And we read that uh, your description of citizenship. So in it, these truths, so, um, and it, I, I love sort of their, their grappling with the words and the labeling of citizen. What does that mean after the 14th? Um, and I just wanted to pose this as a question in terms of the cynicism. This is a COVID measure, but pre-COVID, I saw the play, What the Constitution Means to Me by Heidi Schreck on, you know, when it was playing, I'm, I'm in New York City. And then I like, I, I mean, I, I took my daughter then too, I saw it twice. And then I noticed it was on Amazon Prime. So because of, I, I just did, I gave it to my students. And so we ended up having sort of a debate where they, it was a lot more in terms of preparation, where they sort of effectively, it's the same thing um, that you presented to your students. Like, should we do away with the constitution? And the, I don't know if you've seen the play um, or read about it, but the site, like, should we abolish it? Should we rewrite it? And it, it, it comes from a place of cynicism, but it, I was struck by how evenly split it ended up being after they put so much work into it and saw the historical arc of to redo it would be so, what does that mean when you have a historical document that's also currently a living document? Right, so they ended up approaching it with cynicism, but coming <laughs> coming around to a. But then, what does that mean? Like, what does a redoing mean in a modern construct? How can you then, you know, appeal to the, a wider base of citizenry? Say, so it's not necessarily answering, but I thought it was like a really interesting look at sort of maybe that cynicism that I did kind of just this year because of COVID, because we're hybrid and I wanted to give them an assignment that they could just mm -hmm. watch. So it's interesting. And I would yeah. love your thoughts if you saw the play. <laughs> I did see it, I did see it. Um, I, I think the play is, is really fun. It actually teaches pretty well. I have sometimes just shown the, the epilogue where Heidi and the, um, the girl have the actual little debate because um, that's free on Amazon. You don't have to worry about it. it's just uh so i i recommend that it's it's actually um it's it's like 10 minutes and it works well even just in the classroom as a as a start so i'm gonna go i'm worried that we're gonna run out of time but i i want to hear from amy and jeff who, who haven't spoken yet today i know harry you have your hand up still but um we've heard from you a couple times so amy i was gonna share that i um taught a class for ninth graders which is kind of like their introduction to u.s history and we started with US current events. And some of the things we do, we looked at like what makes America a democracy and students had to kind of um, look at different principles of democracy that might be behind a government and kind of draw images to share with each other. But something we did with the constitution gave them a chance to like either show their cynicism or not. And um, you know, like previous speakers had said, I was kind of surprised that like they still found a way to have faith in government and realized that it wasn't the constitution that was the problem. It was like a lot of them pointed to polarization. So we did something with, um, we do a lot with the uh, checks and balances. So we had them like in groups read three different articles, three different groups in the class where one has like the president trying or succeeding at exercising a veto. Another one has the legislative branch maybe trying to override or something. Um, and another one has the court ruling on a law. And then like each group comes back and presents like 
what happened with their check and balance, what were the issues, what were the powers that could have been exercised. And most of the kids felt like when checks and balances didn't work, it was because of kind of political polarization, but they really appreciated why the system was there in the first place. Great. That's actually a really, I, I, I like how sort of specific it is um, to, to addressing the nature of political functioning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then they all learned what checks and balances was and how it works and they could draw the triangle and know right. like, the different powers and stuff, which is what right. we're getting at, right. allowed a little, you know, contemporary discussion too. Yeah, great, great. Jeff. Hi, so um, I'm a, in a bit, a bit of a different boat and then I'm an, I'm an English teacher. I don't teach history. I've never taught the constitution. Um, but typically when my kids come in the room, we often talk about what else they've learned. Like, you know, what's like a cool thing you learned today and they get some bits of biology and history and Latin and math, whatever. And so I know that, especially for my upper class students, my 11th and 12th graders, they're learning about the constitution in their APUSH classes and their government classes and so on. And, and so, my approach is very, very indirect. And I like to think that I'm, I'm through what we're reading, we're sort of complementing what they're learning in their history classes. And, and so for example, um, all three of my different levels, my ninth, uh, 12th and my AP Lit um, uh, classes, all read novels this year that dealt with slavery in different ways. The freshman read Octavia Butler's Kindred. Um, it's kind of like a time travel sort of sci-fi novel about a woman who goes back into uh, the antebellum South. My 12th graders read uh, Colson Whitehood's The Underground, Underground Railroad. And my AP Lit guys read uh, Beloved by Toni Morrison. It's one of my all time favorite books. And, and I sort of, I, I was thinking about this in terms of um, how you kind of began yesterday um, and how you began these truths with that little newspaper ad of the woman for sale with her, with her child in the paper. And I thought, I think that my, my kids often have a very kind of basic view of, of um, what it means to be a citizen and a person and they know that dehumanization is bad and so through these novels um we sort of explore the idea about not just how um slavery was bad in terms of its physical torments and the deaths and the, the, the real kind of tangible human cost but morrison writes a lot about this in terms of the kind of cost of um being under this sort of system of sort of racial hierarchy. And that, and that that was the real more like insidious nature of slavery. And, and this sort of ties back to the constitution. We talk about well, what does it mean to be a person and have your rights recognized and be a part of, of a country and part of a, of a nation or a state. And one of the things that each of these novels does um, really, really well is that they sort of explore these different characters in kind of their, their full humanity. And so, Yesterday we were reading a bit of Beloved with the, with the AP Lit guys and talking about how um, this one character, this, this, this sort of old man stamp paid who is um, his kind of uh, secret job is, is ferrying fleeges across the Ohio River um, away from slavery. And looking at how this novel shows the, the, the full depth of, of him and his story um, and his conflicted mind that, that wouldn't have been recognized um, in, in the constitution seemingly. And thinking about sort of your approach to some of the stories of, of people in history whose stories aren't usually told, like, like Jane Franklin or someone. And so I, I, I like to think that what they're getting in, in English um, is a bit of kind of a, a complimentary piece to sort of deepen some of the lessons that like all you guys are doing so well. And it's been thrilling to kind of hear how like how um, my history colleagues might be doing some of these same things. So I just wanted to say that and that I really enjoy just listening in and taking part in all this. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think too, Jeff, that there's a way in which something about the cross curriculum piece there is constitutionalizing those novels. That is to say, the stories they tell involve lives who that aren't represented in that legal instrument, but we need to find a way to write them into it in our contemporary moment. And one way we do that is through acts of imagination. And that that has been essential to every rights struggle and every era of reforming the constitution. You need to be able to fully imagine the possibility of equality before you can achieve it. And it's the failure of imagination at that convention, right? It's the, fa it's the fa failure to see that. Um, there are some um, really amazing pieces of scholarship that do stuff, uh, not that you're not gonna be teaching at all, but for people who, who are teaching history and are not going to be teaching a novel. Um, 
I don't mean to just throw book recommendations at you, but my colleague Taya Miles has a new book coming out called All That She Carried, um, which I think of as a kind of very nonfiction version of a Morrison story. So um, I'm just going to tell you about this because I think it's really beautiful. And I actually think it could teach really well as just a, as a, as a, as an excerpt. Um, so when the new Smithsonian, the curators of the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History were getting ready to build, when they had the funding to build a museum, they went all over the country to collect artifacts and objects um, for the collection. And one of the things that they collected um, was a, a sack um, stitched together from flower sacks um, and embroidered on it was, um, my great grandmother gave this to my grandmother and I think it was 1852 when my grandmother was eight years old. She never saw her great grandmother again. And her great, her mother had put a handful of pecans and a dress in this bag. And um, this object is a, such an incredibly powerful countertext to the constitution, right? Like here's this, 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 this the depth of the inhumanity of separating children from their parents, which we all, you know, have the shock of conscience at in our contemporary moment, um, is the, the, the organizing principle of slavery, right? Because it's the denial of the of, of, of basic humanity. Um, and how did people, what are the ways that people resisted that? Well, so Taya has uncovered this whole tradition of what you would, of course, if you were going to be separated from your little child, would you give that child anything that you could that you had that you could give that so that they to, even food for a day right or but maybe something by which they could remember you because you will never see them again um and she recovered the whole history of this particular bag and which family you know the, the woman who had made it the whole descent of the family that had passed it on the woman who when she grew up and you know passed it on and her daughter embroidered this message that carried this history of, of this family that is this object of tenderness and affection and the ties that bind us to one another, um, that contains a world of meaning. Um, I think there's something really rich to do in it. And this is one of the things, you know, when I was talking yesterday about the tombstones and the buildings and the library books, and there's a world of things and the pages of the newspaper to surround the constitution with, um, as, as, a, as a body of historical artifacts, that's that's kind of one way to do it. What I've been really inspired in hearing about this afternoon are the many ways that you all have surrounded um, the constitution. You've, you've placed it in the world in which we live and connected your students to so they can see um, how consequential it is and how worthwhile it is to, to figure it out and to, to track its usage and wrestle with its meaning and argue over it and uh, consider ways that that uh, they might have an obligation to understand it in order to fight for something that's unjust in it. Um, it sounds like, well, you know, or to 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 defend it. Um, uh, I don't mean to be partisan here, but that the 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 ways in which each of the exercises you guys have described, in spite of all the challenges of. I'm sorry, but the Constitution is not like a great read. Um, our students are deeply cynical about it. You know, they live in a world of, of profound cynicism and just a lot of bluster about the Constitution um, that you, there's just such an incredible um, repertoire here of methods, of teaching methods that, that connect students to this historical document to one another, to a larger community of meaning makers and rule makers and, and political fighters. And that's the, whole, that's the whole point of reading the constitution and teaching it. So I, um, I really have uh, nothing to add to what you asked to except to say, um, it's been really a delight to, to kind of pull that knowledge. Um, and I, I hope that what, uh, you take away from this is what I take away is, oh, maybe I'll try that. And maybe I'll try that. And that sounds really fun. And I'll try that. Because um, all of these things are, uh, 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 have, have many different kinds of merit. Um, Renee, I know we're coming close to time, but I don't know if there's a business to take care of or more that. 
we've got about a minute worth of business to take care of. Okay. So if anybody wants to jump in with any other thoughts, that's such a beautiful, a beautiful wrap up of what we've just been talking about today. Does anyone have a last, a last word they'd like to throw in before we, before we wrap up on this beautiful Friday with still a little light outside and lots of daffodils blooming? Still time for more coffee. There, there you go. Yeah. Two more cups. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you know. Now it's the I, wine time. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I think that's Let's I think that's on. the right thing to do at this point. Yes. Well, you know, I'd like I'd like to say that we've got this dual mission at the Academy for Teachers. Um, in part, it is a mission to inspire teachers, to give them the intellectual nourishment that they crave. And it is also to show teachers the respect that they deserve. And I cannot think of a masterclass that brought together those two missions in a more profound way than you've done today, Jill Lepore. So I want to thank you for being here and for, for both of these wonderful sessions with teachers. And I'd like to thank you teachers for making this such a rich conversation. Well, so everyone, yeah, it's been really, it's been a real honor for me to hear what you all are doing. I really, really appreciate it. I've learned, I've learned a lot from you. Thank you so much, everyone. I wish you the best of weekends and, um, and we'll see, we'll see all of you teachers soon. And I hope Jill Lepore, we can get you back for another masterclass. <laughs>